Everybody's paying attention to T-bills and all of these short-term treasuries to try to gauge, I guess, just how much fear, how much risk is out there in the market. But I'm wondering if you could kind of put that into sort of broader historical context. How severe are things right now relative to what we saw in the past? This is not only a conversation piece, but it's actually essential just to take a moment mm -hmm. and survey the landscape. Mm -hmm. And in the landscape, we can actually see from previous episodes dating back to 2011 that in reality, the stress points are actually not that great. The magnitude is not that great. The fear quality is not that great. And so while we are really need to be mindful of how we get to the end of the road, how Congress actually gets to the point of reaching a conclusion, and it might be a bumpy road and it might be at the last moment, mm -hmm. the numbers that we are seeing that were just presented really don't represent that much stress. Mm -hmm. Fear is going to be exacerbated to the tune of hundreds of basis points, if not more, in T-bill yields. Thinking about you know some yields in the excess of seven, eight, nine, ten percent. Oh, We're wow. talking about thirty or forty basis points. Again, not the Pimco baseline prognosis, mm -hmm. but really what we're thinking about is the fact that the landscape right now is very divergent in short-term rates. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the growth in money market funds that we've witnessed over the past you know basically year or so has been defense. People really focusing on defense to portfolios and de-risking their overall portfolios away from risk appetite. What we're seeing here in this location mm -hmm. is a fear of a microcosm of the X state. And unless your prognosis is actually to need cash on a specific day, right. then your fear is probably should be fairly benign in that regard. And I've noticed with some of the market position we've seen, there's almost kind of this donut effect now where people are kind of avoiding kind of some of those July, August maturities, but they still seem to be very, somewhat comfortable going further out uh, in duration, meaning like into September, October. Exactly. I think what we need to yeah. do is also re recognize the fact that the the punitive returns of not getting paid interest for a day or two on a T-bill is actually not that great. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is, is that you might buy a T-bill a few basis points higher than the average yield. Mm -hmm. The real It's not going to really do that much in terms of your overall investment profile. More importantly, I think what we recognize is that the average T-bill yield is trading well through the Fed benchmark right now, which is 5.05%. You can see T-bills trading in 3.3%, 4%. Those are hundreds of basis points through where the rational markets for short-term liquidity should be. Instead, if you look at the landscape, you can find other opportunities within the landscape that yield 5.5%, per, 5 .5%, 6%. They're still high in quality. So an investor should take a moment to really recognize, is it worth a premium to have liquidity on a same-day basis that's exactly in, in alignment with the potential for the X date, which is the date for mm -hmm. potential default? Or am I okay and comfortable to be taking a little bit more liquidity risk, go out the curve a little bit yeah. in terms of a few weeks or a few months to avoid all this discussion? Discussion. So this X date could potentially, though, clash with the next big Fed meeting in mid-June. Uh, and there's concern here about, obviously, what the Fed's next steps are, but also just kind of the economic ramifications of what is now more than a year of uh, rate tightening. Yeah, I think ultimately the Fed is at a, at a point where they're trying to outweigh financial stability or try to reconcile financial stability, growth, and inflation. And what we saw is clearly from the CPI report and even the retail sales today is that the economy remains on a very healthy landscape. And as probably irreconcilable with a dovish bias, and at least in the near term, for the Federal Reserve. So Jerome Powell, the people around the table, we heard from Barkin and, and a few other Fed governors that are a little bit more biased to sort of see where things play out over the next few months, and yet the market still prices in a little more than three cuts by the beginning of January of 2024. That's probably something that has to get reconciled in the near term, and as long as you have data, and specifically wage growth that continues, mm -hmm. that's probably unlikely that the Federal Reserve is going to be responding to a dovish sentiment along the way, despite the headwinds for credit creation, despite the headwinds we're seeing in the regional banking sector, despite concerns that you might actually have uh, a potential for recession, right. which is again our, ba our modest uh, recession line for a modest recession uh, is PIMCO's baseline here. Those are all factors, but they don't necessarily sway the Fed into action to a dovish sentiment. And I think that's the key construct. Yeah. One of the thing, one thing which is yeah. very important, Romain, is, is that w the effects on the market once you get past the X state, once you get past the congressional element of where we're going to find this uh, debt ceiling increase, mm -hmm. is actually an impact to liquidity. And one of the key takeaways for investors is to understand that once you get a resolution to the debt ceiling, 
there's more issuance that comes. And with that more issuance, the Treasury has to rebuild their slush fund, otherwise technically known as the Treasury General Account, right. which removes liquidity from the system. So one of the factors to consider is that liquidity in the overall system, it will actually be somewhat diminished as we get into the third and fourth quarters this year, simply as new issuance comes, comes to the market right. and the Treasury needs to rebuild their cash balance. When does that, when does that level off or get back to a, a more normal it, level? It could take a good number of weeks. So yeah. right now, we, you, the, the yeah. amount of cash in the balance is about uh -huh. $140. Billion, that we that number should could get north of 600 billion. So think about a reduction in excess liquidity to the overall market by the tune of about 500 billion as soon as we get past that congressional approval. Now, but, again, are, you, but are you comfortable right now with kind of the market structure? Meaning the idea that right. there's already been a lot of liquidity distortions because of the Fed stepping back, and now of course with the debt ceiling, is probably creating additional distortions. I would it, think. This is a great point. Yeah. Comfort's a relative word. Mm -hmm. Investors in general should be uh, should be adjusting to liquidity conditions. They should have higher than normal liquidity just given where their baselines were compared to the global financial crisis mm -hmm. and post global financial crisis active central banks are going to be a little bit less active now which means the excess liquidity with the system will naturally have to come down over time that means investors need to be focusing on finding opportunities to have cash management thinking about it actively um, and we saw that with SVB yeah. over the recent time about thinking about cash management as a as a real risk within portfolios and within operating companies and so from that perspective, this is a huge opportunity to take a moment and understand that changing landscape for liquidity is not only a defensive mechanism, but an offensive one for investors of all types to think about yeah. deploying cash and earning liquidity premiums to get returns of five and a half to six and a half percent within the yeah. cash management space. It's very interesting right now.